All right. I'm here with Newt Bailey, who uh, Newt and I have known each other since I believe the early 2000s, around in there, early to mid 2000s. And Newt is a NBC nonviolent communication coach, trainer. He'll say some words about himself in a moment. Um, but new to someone I've asked to have a conversation with me on some topics that are very, very important to me in, in the work that, uh, that I do and that Nude also does with what I like to generally call empathic communication. And this is about consciousness and conversation and social, political change. So we're going to explore those topics together. And I'm very grateful that Newt was wanting to do this with me. And I always enjoy talking to Newt. And now we're recording it and sharing it with others. And hopefully you, those of you watching or listening will enjoy what we cover. So Newt, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure, yes. Um, hello, my name is Newt Bailey. Um, and it was 2005, in fact, I think March of 2005, the first time I walked into a classroom with John Kenyon and Ike Lassiter. Um, and uh, John asked me if I'd done the prerequisites for the course, and I think I bluffed my way through that question. Um, I was enthusiastic. And uh, soon afterwards, I asked John if I could uh, kind of have him as a mentor and follow him around everything that he did local to the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, so we, we did that for a couple of years. And then from the start of 2007, I started uh, more generally um, offering my services as a coach and mediator and started offering, um, creating my own practice groups and offering uh, workshops and so on. And, and my my work ever since has been in nonviolent communication. So we're up to over 13 and a half years of, of doing this work now. And um, early on, I became a collaborative trainer with Bay Area Nonviolent Communication, an organization of which John was one of the founders. So um, that's also been a very key ingredient of my um, making this my, my career. And uh, I can only say that I, I love what I do, both work with private clients as a mediator and coach and public workshops that I offer and also the work that I do in organizations. It's all been enormously fulfilling for me and transformative really of how I communicate with other people and my capacity to be in intimate relationship. Um, yeah, and to sort of resolve my own conflicts when they happen, but also support others uh, resolving theirs. So, um, and building intimacy as well as resolving conflicts. So all of that, um, I'm very grateful for, and I'm grateful to be here in conversation with John, something I do very frequently be in conversation with John, but we don't normally plan to uh, record it and put it out into the world. So this is a, a new and exciting um adventure yeah yeah and it, 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 these uh, both of these topics particularly the first one is uh, one uh, newt you and i have spoken about a fair amount over the years uh, in various ways and various depths but yes we've never recorded a conversation about it and um so my hope for this time is we can yeah really use this as an opportunity to, to kind of enjoy that conversation for ourselves, but also how it can benefit other people. And um, so in terms of you know, consciousness and what that, it actually, as I said, I'm thinking too, that Newt, you and I did a, a course together, an online course together many years ago now. I think it was called like NBC and spirituality, something like that. And so I think of consciousness as it, it can very much be about spirituality, but it doesn't have to be, at least in the traditional way, people often think about spirituality. But to me, in the, in the very maybe almost literal sense of the word, spirit as non-material, 
uh, formless to 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 access that dimension you know what does it mean to to somehow connect with that dimension of of reality of our experience of reality um and and then how does that relate to our work with communication conversation sort of the pragmatic technical you know very in the uh in the nitty gritty difficulties of 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 life and of of conflicts and challenges and and how do we communicate when things get really rough so and and and, and the ability to bring in there you know another word for is is mindfulness and i th i think mindfulness in my experience people a lot of times use that word to mean like i would say a, an aspect of consciousness where it's about um and how we we practice awareness, but it's like awareness focusing on certain things and, and, but identifying kind of as the subject being aware of objects and, and, um, and, and at my experience is just a whole nother dimension. That's, that's often called non-duality or kind of getting beyond a, a sense of a separate self and more of a kind of unified experience. And, and, something that's been really important to me is how to hold these two things together. You know, the duality of our kind of subject object experience and a, a, and a more non-dual awareness where we, we can, we don't, I don't, my experience, I don't lose the sense of, of, of a self, but you can kind of expand beyond that to where you're kind of holding a larger sense of awareness and, and, and how that's practical in terms of dealing with difficulties, how to bring that into communication and, in my experience, nonviolent communication, the basic components of it, observation, feeling, need, request, are dimensions of mindfulness, dimensions of awareness and consciousness that, um, that it's not just about language. So I just you know, want to explore, uh, you, know, new, you have, a, in my experience, a pretty rich background of teachers you've studied with. You've, you've, you've really done a lot of work in that, in that realm of of uh, kind of the non-dual world and and um and 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 i'm, and I'm but i we don't often talk about exactly how you bring that into your work you know and mm -hmm. um and and for me to talk with you about that as well my explorations with that but that's that's really the the, the realm i want to sort of keep weaving through together um these different uh these different ways to think about our experience, awareness and language and how they interweave in this different kind of levels of awareness. Hmm. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to say to set this up. Um, what, maybe one thing is like, I think often spiritual teachers that I know about, you, you turned me on a long, a while back to this person, Rupert Spira, who I've really enjoyed being connected, you know, Eckhart Tolle is somebody I started studying way back 20 years ago and then and then um rupert was somebody you mentioned and i i i ended up getting into into that and you have people you've really been drawn to um but often those those people and other people it, it's like well it's all about the non-dual it's all everything is one and there's no real separateness it's all delusion and illusion and it, it you know or of course the folks that are more like it's like that stuff is all kind of airy fairy and it's not really real. And it's all about kind of the being with the reality of our, of this world and, and the difficulties and challenges as they are and not trying to kind of avoid it by transcending to some etheric realm where we don't have to deal with any, any difficulties. So the, what's really, what's really um, very important to me is like, how do you hold these two together without having to choose between them? How do they fit together? So is there anything you want to say as kind of like what in this area you're particularly interested in that you'd like to talk about today anyways? Well, just as I was sitting and listening to you speak, John, you know, there's a kind of um, little ideas and memories and one thing or another flickering up. So I, I guess um, it's a question of which one to choose really. But, but I like very much the idea of being practical um one person that i've um 
enjoy. She doesn't refer to herself as a teacher, even though other people would call her a teacher. And um, she says, we, we, may, we may be sages, you know, like um, people who are trying to tap into whatever inner wisdom they have, but we want to be practical sages who, you know, who are not kind of uh, finding themselves unable to, uh, you know, sleep through the night or pay the bills or something like that, you know. So there's this great desire for practicality and a great desire for practicality in relationship as well, you know, um, just because I might have an interest in a particular kind of spiritual thinking or practice or something like that doesn't mean that everyone else around me suddenly does. And I don't want to be getting into some demand on the rest of the world to align with whatever I do in my spare time, you know, or, or what kind of motivates me. Um, and you know so well from mediating conflicts between people that uh, there's a lot of very practical matters often that come up when you're working with people who are just running up against it with each other, with their parent or their partner or their business partner or whoever it might be. We're very much in the, in the nitty gritty of the circumstances that they want to tell us about and they want to resolve. And yet simultaneously for me, there's always been this, um, this component of that process that would be easily labeled as spiritual would easily be labeled as something which some might think of as being woo woo or as being um, outside of the normal kind of materialistic practicalities of life or something like that. Mm. Um, but it's something, something as simple as um, I can be working with say people who are going through a divorce and we're staring at spreadsheets together trying to figure out how assets are going to be divided or something like that but uh, i'm simultaneously holding to whatever extent i can an attitude of compassion for both people and the attitude of compassion is not something that can be quite described in the same practical terms as a spreadsheet or who gets the couch or um you know anything like that like it's it's somehow on a different level of of intention or of um attention or whatever and yet it's my sense is that it's equally important and i i feel like i notice the difference um you know uh when I do do those kinds of things that are more about a kind of attitude of consciousness or something like that, um, it seems to make a difference to the practicalities. You know? When you say that, you mean what you do inside of yourself with that or how you kind of experience yourself offering that to a person or people you're working with? Say a little more about that. I think first and foremost, just reminding myself, mm. you know, so um, if I set, you know, I try and uh, set the intention and then stick with it, you know, throughout the period of time of working with an hour or two hours or whatever time period I'm working with people. And even when I'm not on the call with them, just if I regard them, if they cross through my memory, just to kind of have an attitude of compassion or open heartedness towards them. Right. And, um, and of course there can be, um, greater ease identifying with one person's position than another person's position, because I've got tendencies and preferences and history and all these kinds of things. Um, and so there might be a way in which it's easy to be open hearted towards this person, but, but for this person, it happens way more easily if I remember to remind myself as a, as a, a kind of a attitude or a consciousness that I want to be in. Mm. And that makes a really practical difference. Similarly, if I do the same thing before workshops, you know, just, um, I always try and remember to invoke the names of my, my various teachers, uh, including yourself, um, before teaching a workshop. And I noticed that my experience of leading the workshop is affected by whether or not I take the few minutes before the workshop to do that. 
just to remember Marshall Rosenberg, things that I've learned from him and from Mickey Kashtan and from you and from other people outside of the nonviolent communication sphere. It makes a difference. There's just definitely some shift in internal state or where my awareness is being put or how present I am with, with what's happening from moment to moment, you know, within a mediation or within a workshop or something like that. Those things are affected. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, you know, as you were pointing out, there's also occasions to be encouraging other people into that shift of consciousness as well. And that's, that's a different and bigger topic, but certainly something we can, we can talk about more, I think. Yeah. 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 So as, as I hear you talk about that, I, what comes into my mind is how, you know, how do I do that? How do, how do I, what is the, the, the doing of, of what you're saying? And my experience of it is I have a few different practices, but it's to be um, like aware of my own thinking and other people's as a sort of appearances, like appearing in the, the field of, of just being aware, right? Then there's different thoughts, like right now, like words from me and words from you. And there's something about shifting to normally we're like identifying with like, okay, now I'm talking and what do I'm going to say? And versus sort of just like, oh, there's words appearing here from me. And then they were from you and your body language and mine. And it's all just kind of appearing. And that to be able to sort of shift to that and then to also experience my body sensations that way, to kind of feel connected to your body sensations as I, as I sort of feel into a kind of presence with mine. And, and then from even beyond that is, is this sort of open expansive, like being aware of all the space around, you know, in the room, say, you know, there's just to kind of that open, it's called open awareness in some traditions, right? Just being like my visual gaze, very wide and expansive and to like feel the energy and aliveness of my body, which I like to think of sort of universal, that energy is in everything and animating everything. So different ways that I like, as I'm talking to people, as I'm working with them, how I, how do I try to kind of go there to that place that opens me to compassion, to empathy, to compassion. Um, and then, yeah, if, if I'm going to offer that anything overtly to, to the people I'm working with, that's, that's another thing too. Uh, but one is just how do I embody it? Kind of how do I experience something different than just the normal kind of me as this, as just this self that's interacting with others, but that, that um, yeah. So I don't know if there's anything, you know, you want to say more about kind of how you hold that or do that. Um, there's a few other things I could say as well, kind of related to that, but I just want to see if that stimulates anything first before I go there. What came into my mind is that um, you've heard me say this before when we've been co-leading or back when I used to be on your assistant team. Um, spending time with the martial artist and and um yes. teacher on uh, on topics of consciousness i think he uses the word ontology mm -hmm. um but uh him saying that if there's someone who you're wanting to emulate a teacher whose skills you're wanting to uh, master yourself then sometimes just deliberately um uh, mirror what they're doing Mm. you know like if they're wielding a sword see if you can wield the sword the same way that they're doing as you watch them in a video or watch them in a room or something like that um or if they're playing an instrument you know this kind of thing even though you cannot actually do the thing that they're doing it's not mockery but it is kind of mimicry mm -hmm. of them and uh i remember early on coming to nonviolent communication practice groups that you were facilitating and also uh, weekend workshops sometimes and I can remember certain moments when something started happening in the room and I would, and you were the facilitator. I wasn't, I was just there, you know, kind of helping out and not 
not responsible for anything in particular. And so when some conflict broke out between two people in the room or when someone started getting upset with you, um, I would just be sitting back in a cold sweat, just uh, feeling very grateful that it wasn't me that was responsible to kind of respond to that person in that moment because I had no idea how I would respond to the person in that moment. And there's a lot of people who, you know, they've signed up for this workshop and they're wanting a learning experience and suddenly something's happening that maybe is not uh, to their liking because it was not what they'd signed up for. You know, there's all this anger and upset happening in the room or something. And uh, I just have this vivid memory of, of I'd be kind of starting to kind of be in a cold sweat and maybe tense up and lean forward as if I needed to spring into action. And you'd just be sitting backwards and uh, with your hands in your pockets, even if you were sitting in a chair that has arms, like an office chair with arms, somehow you find a room for your hands to be in your pockets when you're sitting down, which is a terribly uncomfortable thing for me. And I've deliberately done it whilst talking about this to remind myself of it, <laughs> sitting in that uncomfortable position of having my hands in my pockets. But just how there was this, like, no rush to kind of, um, to even lean forward, you know, like no body language that was suggesting panic or urgency or you know oh there's something terrible happening here that i need to kind of intervene in or something like that but just to kind of leaning back and being like let me make sure that i'm understanding you and this kind of thing and um um so yeah that that came to mind as you were speaking uh as somehow the way that it looked, all I was seeing was the outer manifestation of this inner thing. You'd been involved with nonviolent communication for um, for many years before I was, and um, been around Marshall a lot and all that kind of thing, and just your own personal way of being, I guess. Um, but it allowed this giving off of a sense of calmness. Um, whatever's happening here is not a terrible event that everyone needs to panic about. Um, let's just stay with it. Let's see what's happening. What's this person saying? What's this person saying? And so I kind of see that thing, you know, that field mm. of like, oh, this person's now saying mm. a loud voice or standing up and saying that they don't like being here and they're going to leave or, um, and yeah. I don't know. That's what comes to mind, really, is just uh, th that's the outer manif manifestation of it. But the inner world that I who knows what was going on with you at the moment. You might have been like the swan with the legs kicking vigorously underneath the water, but above the water, you're just sailing along. I have no idea. But mm. um, but certainly I got that impression of a great um, presence and and kind of what you were just talking about, really, like things yeah. arising in yeah. your field of awareness. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't made the, the connection between those things, being in a workshop or a practice group and something like that happening and, and what I just said. But yeah, I see that. Um, so actually you saying that though makes, uh, brings up some um, something to share that's a little more personal about um, dealing with those, those, those difficult feelings of, of panic fear and um that's what you know of course there's a lot of different emotions that can be difficult but that that one i'm thinking of in this one and how like i'll wake up in the night even now sometimes and and there's this thinking about you know have i done enough what's going to happen did i take care of all the things i need to what it, am i doing all the right things am i not am da, 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 right the mind the way it worries and and then the body, my body really responding with, with fear and adrenaline. And, and then I'm trying to kind of work with that in the night, right? And, and, and it's hard. I, and I, I could, you know, just focus on my breath or I can do the things I was just saying a few minutes ago. But I find it's really challenging. Like that sort of I know how to, I'm curious, you know, your own personal experience and then maybe of, of teachers, you know, or just your sense of it in the world. But just to be transparent about, I've been practicing, yeah, nonviolent communication for over 20 years. I've been interested in spirituality and consciousness and meditation and practices for um, for a long time as well. And I have a sense of um, being able to 
go to that place where, um, yeah, actually in this moment, I'm having trouble when my son Arjun's come into the room to get something. So just, do you need, no, I don't you're good, okay. Um, I was aware that I was losing some focus there, trying to talk about something a little difficult and uh, too many, too much going on. So, um, but yeah, so the, the, this edge, what it seems like, it, it seems real to me that with a lot of study, especially for the last few years, I've really been deep dive into, I've been like almost obsessed with this um, non non duality as a as a as a practice of awareness or meditation or mindfulness practice that really goes to that place and different teachers I follow and study and really like this wanting to plumb the depths of that mystery and understand it like, and in a really practical way, you know, not in a just theoretical, but a really lived experience. And I have a sense like, I kind of know how to shift from being this separate self to kind of just being this more open, expansive consciousness, consciousness that is that is just aware of the contents like me and you and everything arising, right? Just everything you can, from a certain perspective, everything is just arising in a field of consciousness and it's not personal. It's just conscious. And, and to me that the furthest step there is that even everything that arises is not separate from consciousness. It's, it's actually a modulation of consciousness to use perhaps a, a metaphor like space. The, the, the space around us this is the same space that's inside of us and actually the same space that goes out to the edges of the universe. That's, which is just an incredible, like how vast space is and that it's inner as well as outer and it's not different. The outer isn't different than the inner space. So, and often people use that sense of space is very synonymous with consciousness or awareness but the idea that every object, at least in our field of perception, every object that arises is just coming out of that conscious is actually just a full, is consciousness taking shape. It's not separate. It's space, maybe in a physics sense, every object is actually just space that vibrates into form. So the idea that there's actually nothing but consciousness and, and consciousness is, is aware, it's self-aware. So, I have a sense that not only can I talk about that, I can experience it to some degree and it comes and goes and I don't stay there very long. And, but, and at the same time, I, you know, I can def I can be totally gripped by fear in the middle of the night and panic and self doubt and all of that on a kind of subjective relative kind of self separate self level that I don't in any way feel immune from that. And then there's part of me that says, I don't want to be, you know, like part of me does. <laughs> I, want, I don't want to feel fear again. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be scared and, you know, triggered and angry and upset and hurt and in pain. And yet that's the richness of life, isn't it? Like that's where, you know, the people that talk about the soul and the, the soulfulness of, of the, 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 the richness of a, of of the the pain as well as the beauty and to, and the be deeply in that as well as being able to kind of be accessing the sort of formless impersonal realm so like the personal and the impersonal to, so again i i just something about that that feels so like important to me to I don't know, sort of keep practicing that to, to, I, don't, I don't want to give up my humanity. I don't want to think that I can transcend it. And at the same time, there, there is that. And yet it doesn't feel like I, I can just, I'm this enlightened master that never has any difficulties or challenges. So it's really, it's kind of strange experience that I see these other meditation teachers or, or, or men, men, mindfulness spiritual teachers, and they seem like, wow, I'm, I mean, I'm not where they are. And yet I have a sense of, of, what they're talking about and I can, you know, I can, I can go there, but it's, it doesn't make me immune from all the difficulties too. It definitely makes me more resilient. Like I don't get stuck there. I can get out of there pretty easily now, or I don't see, yeah, I don't stay in that place that long, but I definitely can 
get very gripped by those emotions, those experiences of difficulty and just like anybody else. So I don't know. I'm just curious, just anything you want to say, your experience with that or your experience of kind of people in the world who seem to be very, very evolved, enlightened, you know, and, and uh, may or may not experience those things anymore. I first of all have to clear the silly image out of my head is that I was wondering whether or not you have pockets in your pajamas, because if you did, and you wake up in the night, you could just deliberately put those hands in there. And suddenly you'd just be calm. That could be the missing ingredient. I've never tried it, Newt, but you know, I might, I might try that now that you're mentioning it. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. And if you patent that idea, you know, just remember, It'd be yours. Yeah. Remember where you, where you got it. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, what springs to mind is the, is the urge to, um, the urge to cling on to certain experiences and the urge to get rid of other experiences. Um, so fear and panic in the night could easily be responded to. When I think of my own life, you know, there's been plenty of times when I've woken up in the morning, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, um, happens a lot less now, I think, because of the fact that what I'm doing with my daytime is much more to my liking. But when I was a high school teacher in London, there were definitely occasions when, and this is no offense to the people I was teaching, I had great relationships with many of my students. I won't say all. Um, but, uh, but there were times and I was just like, why am I living in the city? And why am I doing this work? And I can't believe I've got to go and stand in the rain and the fog wait for the bus and whatever. And there was definitely not um, there was definitely not a kind of neutral stance towards that. Um, there was real desire for that not to be the case, and there, so there was a sort of perpetual fighting against certain experiences that I would be having, including standing at a bus stop waiting seemingly endlessly for buses and stuff. Mm. Um, and then there's other experiences, you know, like being at a really fun music event or something like that. And I can remember at times being at a really fun music event, you know, around the time when I first knew you, I can think of being at these events that, that I'd, they'd start up and I'd be immediately thinking, oh, um, what if I'm not able to come to the next one of these? And literally the event had just started. People <laughs> were just starting to, the music was starting to play, people were starting to dance and everything. And I'm thinking about what if something happens to me that prevents me being able to drive here or afford to come to this kind of thing anymore or whatever it might be. And I would catch myself in the act of how I was trying to like keep a hold of the experience that I was having and make sure it didn't go away and make sure that yeah. it was going to come back again in the future yeah. and this kind of thing. Yeah. So the clinging on and the pushing away, yes. I suppose if, um, if I'm, if I'm more uh, living from a place of, oh, so now that's what's happening, you know, that kind of attitude to things. Like if you and I had planned to have dinner uh, this evening and then you called me and I'm already sitting in the restaurant and you're saying, I'm actually not going to be able to make it because one of my kids is sick or something like that. Um, I think in past years, I would have been much more, you know, reactive. I might have been reactive against you. I might be reactive just inside i might be oh, my my life sucks you know even when i managed to book something to hang out with someone that it doesn't work out there could have been an internal dialogue like that and now i think it'd be much more likely that i'd kind of go oh that's unexpected you know that's mm. not what i was expecting i was expecting to be hanging out with john for a couple of hours in a restaurant but as it turns out i'm just sitting in a restaurant on my own now mm -hmm. and so so now what you know now we're into this it was always the unknown because you, well, I wouldn't have known what we were going to talk about or something, but now it's just like, Oh, now this is happening. Yes. So, so what next or, or what now, you know? And I feel like that's some change that has come about for me over the last 15 years or, or um, maybe a little bit before that too, from walking around um, Soma in San Francisco, listening to Eckhart Tolle for an hour or two at a time in my lunch breaks. Mm. Um, and, uh, so it started then even, but really just being in that place of like, yeah, this is what's happening. I, I'm feeling, you know, I'm saying I'm having a panic attack or something. What's actually happening? Oh, 
this is happening. There's a kind of like a clenching of muscles in certain places and there's a certain cyclical thinking that's happening and, yeah. you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not a pushing away or a clinging on to. It's a taking an avid interest in whatever the thing is. Um, yeah, that's what springs to mind. Well, I think let's say maybe one more thing about this, and then we can see about transitioning to that the other topic I want us to touch on. But um, yeah, and what you're saying, it's it's. I find in terms of bringing it back to communication and this kind of communication that we do that's focused on empathic connection, compassion, um, that to me, the, this ability to do what you just said is so, it's so part of that. Uh, the, the ability to experience ourselves, like to be able to, to notice, to observe, to, you know, so in terms of observation and feeling need request, but to, to observe uh, what our mind is doing that way, which means being the awareness that's observing what our, what the mind is doing and the same with the body and being able to be present in the body as the kind of this, this aware presence with that. And, and so I just like, to me, in order to have the languaging to talk about that, the experience that way, you know, to talk about what our mind is doing, what our body is doing is it's like, yeah, to be able to actually experience that, to experience that mindfulness, right? To, and then the language can just kind of naturally describe what we're experiencing. Yeah. And I think some people study this work, this kind of communication without really going to the, those places and try to just use the right words. And I find that doesn't often work so well that it's when you can really feel the shifts happening, that really like something really changing in the experience is like when it's tied to this, like actually shift, basically shifting from identifying with our thoughts and feelings and body to the kind of the awareness that's holding it and being more identified with that. And then, and then for me going to need is even beyond a, a, a sense of, like my needs or your needs, but just to, to needs and needs that we all have. And that takes us into that universal kind of beyond the, the separateness place, this where we're all interconnected and Thich Nhat Hanh called it uh, interbeing, you know, that, 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 that connection that we're part of the whole, we're connected. So to me, from the part, experiencing the part of to being kind of experiencing the whole and, and that, and the request being kind of acting from that place, acting compassionately from that place. And so to be able to go there myself, even when, like I said, I can get kind of lost, disconnected, forget, and then I have to remind myself and come back to it. But that that is to me, such an important aspect of, of this work and sharing with other people. Can I help and guide other people to do that? You know, to whatever degree they're open to it, to, to not just, helping them learn the languaging, but also something about at least how I frame things to them, how I'm reflecting back what I'm hearing in a way that's kind of embodying in a sense that shift to more identifying with awareness instead of the thinking or the feeling or the body. So um, that's my question there. Yeah, maybe just anything else come up for you hearing kind of bringing that back to to communication and how we live our own communicating with with ourselves and others but also how we can support other people around this kind of communication yeah um a couple of things came to mind um one is that i just suddenly had a kind of self-consciousness for a moment of um trying you know when i say oh if i'm having a uh, kind of sense of dread or panic or something that now i have a different way of relating to that than i might have done in the past it could sound like i'm saying like you know oh i just don't care either way whatever happens i'm just neutral about everything you know i mm -hmm. i 
I have no needs. I have, you know, everything is just as it is and there's nothing coming for me that's requiring anything to be any different or any kind of thing. And that's, that's so not it really in the same way that, um, if, if, uh, if, if, a, if a tree is growing in a forest and then some other tree falls in such a way as to block most of the sunlight that was falling on that tree, that tree will kind of, or certain plants, I don't know which trees do this, but they will, they will kind of send leaves out in a different direction where there's some sunlight where previously they weren't. They're not just kind of like, oh, whatever, okay, then I'll just shrivel up and die. Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's not the way that life plays out through mm. organisms. They make adjustments to... Um, to facilitate life really you know and uh and life being more than just survival you know like in the same i've just been watching this very fun video on social media of um somewhere i guess in new england or somewhere where there's a huge pile of leaves in the garden and the person has this labrador dog called stella who just loves to charge across the yard and just leap into this massive um stack of leaves right raked leaves that's about eight feet high and it's purely for the fun of it and the joy of it life is playing through the animal in such a way as to just be celebrating life and playing in this sort of way right and the same is true for us so i can be observing that in me is is whatever's happening right now and and over there i'm curious about what's happening over there right now and there doesn't have to be um an insistence on you doing anything in relationship to me, mm-hmm. but there can be a sort of just a natural kind of like, Oh, it would be nice if, you know, what if, what if we could sort of spend a longer time sometime, just have dinner and talk about these things. Cause we so rarely see each other these days in person, you know, it's all just over zoom or something. And, and so just that thing of like, I can welcome that idea as it comes in, um, and be like, oh, now that's arising, you know? And it's a different thing arising than a sense of dread. <laughs> it's just a different thing. But then there's the kind of, there's the appearance of us as separate human beings within the world. And and there might be just a kind of a very natural um, offer or request. And I realized in the moment as you were speaking, I suddenly got the impression and seeing flowers in your picture then, um, of the, the flower and the bee or the butterfly that pollinates the flower and how the flower is so clearly both an offer and a request at the same time. Yeah. It's requesting the support of the bee and it's also offering nectar or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so there's some way in which, you know, what might arise is this just natural movement towards an interaction with another person, you know, whether it be um, asking someone to work with you on something or a date, or could you cook dinner this evening? Cause I'm busy or, you know, whatever it might be. Mm. Um, And then that's allowed to be there as well. You know, Um, we're allowed to um, have feel the movement towards something. And then a request or an offer is just a natural um, movement that comes along with that. And if we're paying attention, um, then uh, it's not then like you're saying, it's not about kind of, oh, now I'll, I need to ask this right because otherwise John might say no. You know, I want him to work with me on this project, but if I don't word it correctly, he might say no. So I need to word it correctly so he will say yes. That's getting into that very tight mm. version of trying to change your communication habits and n- not criticizing that because I think I I went through that myself for sure. You know, a kind of fairly tight thing of trying to language everything correctly, mm. um, rather than saying well that the languaging that Marshall Rosenberg taught and that we, and that we talk to people about to some extent is in some ways more just a description of what we see when actually paying attention from moment to moment to what's coming up and what, what seems to be coming up in another person and just trying to put words to that. They kind of fall into a pattern in a way of observations, feelings, needs yeah. and requests, but we're, we're more, um, that pattern can be useful. It kind of like, it, it also knowing that 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 structure exists can call forward certain ways of wording things, but at the same time, just being present with whatever's arising in us and in other people on its own kind of puts forth words of that kind kind of thing. So it's both, it's coming from us, but it's also being pulled forth from us by the, by that sort of structure that 
NBC talks about. Um, that's what comes to mind for me in this yeah, moment. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hearing the, like when you talked about the play of, of, of life, like the things matter. So if you are, you know, able to be present, as we're saying, or aware, or different words for this, but not, maybe not identified with uh, our, our reactive thinking and feeling, but we're, you know, we're present with that in a different way, but still, we still, there's still a caring about life and being drawn to what feeds us and fulfills us and, and needs like the way that needs can be these just universal qualities. They're met, they're not mad, doesn't matter versus the, 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 the beauty of meeting them and the pain of not met and the joy of meeting and the being in that dance, that flow of, of, of aliveness of, of so that it's not this detached, um, above it all, transcending, just observing everything without yeah. caring because you're you're just kind of pure pure awareness and nothing really. It's right. So it's not that that yeah. And that's what I think I was trying to get at earlier too, or just to just sort of state at the beginning that that for me it's it's easy to kind of go one way or the other, but to to hold these things together. And I think this work that it being about communication and how do we, how do we meet our needs with each other or with ourselves and each other? Like it may, it keeps it real and yeah? it keeps it real and, and, and not just metaphysical or detached or something like that. But it's, it's, it, for me, it's just still an, it's an ongoing exploration, how to, how to be fully in the the kind of the muck of it, right? Of the of the the fear, the panic, the anger, the whatever, and 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 not, as you said, that there's a can I can I be with that without pushing it away or trying to hold on to positive experiences or whatever, um, or negative experiences? Can I be with it without trying to keep it here because it's become part of my identity? Yeah, the guy it, with the anxiety. It the self-pity or the anxiety or the familiarity of it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's something about it. It's such like, to me, such a subtle dance back and forth between, um, yeah, what I like calling kind of the, 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 the non-dual expansiveness consciousness in the big sense. And then this intimacy of, of the, of our subjective subject object, selfness in the world that that in suffering and difficulty and pain and and uh, how not to lose any of that but and and actually how to bring out the best of that uh, so anyways that that's what's continues to be an ongoing exploration for me and how does that come into the four components of observation feeling need request and how we communicate it how does that all come into the the nitty gritty of that so and uh when you said it. intimacy as well i was just thinking and the uniqueness as well right mm. it's like we can become blase about about life oh just the same also you know how's life same thing every day whatever that kind of thing and yet it's not the same thing every day you know i'm looking at this picture here this work of art with john Kenyon in it right your particular room and the things that you've got there and the flowers those flowers will be different tomorrow yeah. and they'll never be re reproducible kind of thing this this conversation is a conversation that resembles many conversations I've had with you before and, and that I've had with other people or listened to other people having, but it's not the same as those. It has unique aspects to it. And there's something about that for me that is, um, you know, like you say, the intimacy with life, the felt sense of this right now that's happening. Yeah. And, um, and dipping into that with as great, greater frequency as I, as I can uh, with perhaps some aspiration of just kind of living there all the time, you know, like mm -hmm. perhaps there's some experience of life that I don't have that would be more of this or something. I don't know, but just as I am now, like the, the, um, the joy in a way of going unconscious and maybe becoming kind of consumed by anger or irritation or something or fear or something like that and then kind of waking up from that to like oh wow but look at that you know look yeah. out the window at the birds on the tree yeah. um 
or the dog diving into the leaves, you know, yeah. and there's a great joy in that in a way that of, of kind of coming back, you know, coming back to life. You know, I'm thinking of yeah. Marshall saying that often when we're angry, we're effectively dead. And then we kind of, we come back to life at some yeah. point when we start paying attention to what's going on for us again. Um, yeah. 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 And I could, I could feel it in your words, in your body language, what you're saying, uh, as well as the, the words itself. So that's nice. Um, so, yeah, I think we, we don't have too much longer. I want to touch on this other topic, if you're ready for that. And, and with the, yeah. the little bit of time that we have left. Um, so let's see, how do I want, I want to set it up again as, it really, it, it, and, and these, these two topics were very central to Marshall Rosenberg, who is my mentor and I studied with very deeply for years. But he often talked about not only the, the spirituality or the consciousness of the work, but also social change or the political, the, the, the larger societal, cultural, systemic level of things. And um, that that this work isn't just about the inter per, intra and interpersonal, but also looking out at the larger structures and systems that we live in and how dysfunctional and unhealthy they can be and, and seem to be to me right now more than ever that quite unhealthy and dysfunctional and, and kind of collapsing basically under the weight of their dysfunctional dysfunctionality. Um, as we are in mid mid 2020 here leading up to the election uh, in the U S so this uh, it's for a while now, I guess, um, especially as, as we've come into the, the election season and the, the COVID-19 coronavirus and just seeing, and the, and the, the, um, racial injustices that have become so apparent that if, you know, like me thought that, oh, well, yeah, it probably st it still happens some, but it's so much better now than it was. Like, wow, we used to be, can't believe we, you know, and now just, you know, oh my God, it's still so present with us that white supremacy is not this little fringe thing. It's like pretty predominant. It, it weaves through a lot of our structures and systems, this racial violence and discrimination and and inequality and 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 the and just wealth and power inequalities that are incredibly magnified now yeah so all that that i i have this incredible draw to want to contribute at that level more than i ever have and marshall talked about it a lot he tried to do what he could there but and i had no idea so for the longest time i haven't even tried to focus there but lately just kind of seeing where I think we are as a kind of as human beings, like with the challenges we're now starting to face and how things seem more unstable and kind of crumbling that it's like, Oh, I really want to be part of the, the, the change at these, that these other levels. And, but of course it's really hard to know how, how, how to be of service at that level with the kind of work we do at least right with communication and people learning skills and and yet um it seems to me what we're offering to people is are the kind of things people need to 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 shift into or to use in this sort of transition i think of as kind of a great transition time for human beings a, a time of evolution if we can make some jumps so that we can survive at some level perhaps we don't we don't know so anyways, it's really, really on my mind a lot how to how to do that. And um, I think there are a lot of ways to try that are actually not necessarily very helpful. But um, so there's a lot of things I could share more about that. But I also want to just check anything you want to say, whether it's more specific or just more general like me, kind of how you think about this in a broader way. My mind's going first to that book, Invictus, that I mentioned to you the other day. I've been reading about um, N Nelson Mandela, a lot of it after he got out of prison, you know, after his, whatever yeah. it was, 26 years in prison or something. And, um, and kind of just getting to know more about 
the way that he was trying to do such huge things because talk about racism and the need for social change you know uh south africa is a case in point right mm. and um in the 90s with apartheid and everything and um And so there's something there about uh, how many people spoke about his obvious big-heartedness, compassion, goodwill. And this includes people who'd been lifelong, essentially, racists and, um, and absolutely, you know, thought of him as a terrorist. And they'd been raised to believe that that's all he was, you know. Mm -hmm. and he was typical of his race and he was you know not to be trusted and all this kind of thing and there are so many stories of him walking to, into a room with people who'd only ever heard stories about him and largely stories from other people who believed the same things that they did and then they walk into the presence of this man who um just in his dealings with people in his in, in his vocation to be someone who was um kind of a, a ceaseless warrior for justice, really. Um, his way of being was not, he might get kind of fierce sometimes in his determination to make something happen, and he would really kind of say what he felt needed to be said and that kind of thing. But equal to that, and the thing that's certainly in this book, more than that is talking about the the way in which people would be just won over by his charm, everyone talks about his charm and pe talks about his compassion and the sense of big heartedness and so on. Mm. And so there's something there for me, which is um, when, I, when I've worked in organizations that are, you know, agencies or not-for-profit organizations that have a mission, you know, a mission of social justice or of social change or of um, supporting populations who are less supported in some way and um, and sometimes seeing the ways in which those organizations can fall into all of the sort of familiar habits of of uh, me me versus you and us the versus them and all that kind of thing like in spite of the the mission or the vision they have that really is it uplifting. And when you read their website, you're like, wow, awesome. I want to give these people money. But then if you go in sometimes to try and help with mm. the difficulties that are happening, you see it's like an organization is a group of human beings and also a group of ideas and principles and structures and systems and all the rest of it all put together. But if those human beings are trained by their experience to see you as other um, not necessarily because of obvious, more obvious things like being of a different race. That obviously is one of the things that can happen. But even just you don't agree with me on what the best way is to to achieve our mission. Hmm. So therefore, now you're other than me and not to be trusted. And I need to build a team around me that can defeat you. So we get to do good in the way that I want to do good rather than the way that you want to do good, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So seeing that for me, it just showed that there is this huge need for like the the big view and the desire to to put your energy towards you know like being the change that you want to see that kind of idea really um but sometimes the the effort can be one of very much focusing on the change that's needed out there that I'm trying to make happen and not the change that's also needed in here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's talked about as an either or, you know, oh, people are putting all of that, you know, um, obviously there are people within the NBC community who say, you know, uh, NBC commu uh, trainers are putting too much effort and work into personal growth and personal change and this kind of thing. But we all can see that social justice and environmental change, those are the places where everyone needs to be putting their attention. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, well, yes, but if you've got a whole load of people who are still operating along the consciousness of me versus you and of self, you know, I'm attacking you or I'm attacking myself or, you know, I'm looking for the enemy, all that kind of thing, then you're trying to bring about 
social change and environmental change from a position that is not an enormously powerful position because you're just running up against your own internal struggles and your struggles with others again and again and again. Yeah. And so it's not an either or. And so my, my sense is that's the biggest thing on my mind always is that I do want to be um, listening to the, the very clear impetus in me to, to lend whatever skills and abilities I have to uh, environmental and social change. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose track of how important it is what's going on here and how aware I am of what's going on here and how I'm showing up in interaction with other people, because my sense of, you know, these inspirational leaders uh, is that that was very important too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not trying to make out that any of these people were kind of like perfect individuals. I don't know to say that, but I do get that there was some great personal power that came from, um, attentiveness to the mission, but also attentiveness to self, you know, like, like when the guy walked into the room with a gun to shoot Martin Luther King and people caught the guy cause they saw his gun and people were screaming for blood in the room apparently. And I believe, uh, King's words were something like now is not the time for re revenge. Now is the time for inclusion. Mm. And just said that immediately into a huge room of like really angry people who, you know, who were, being his bodyguards in a sense and mm. keeping him alive in that moment, mm. but also wanted to use the, the old fashioned mechanisms yeah. of warfare and revenge. Um, but King did not. And, uh, and, and therefore lives as an inspiration for so many people, I think, um, because of that. And there are so many other uh, examples of, of people um, becoming inspirations because of their ability to really, you know yeah stay grounded in a much more solid and deeper place of power than the sense of power which comes from them just tear this person limb from limb you know yeah, yeah. which is a kind of very limited and fleeting and and um as marshall would probably say tragic expression of physical power so mm -hmm. that's what springs into my mind and i see we've only got another four minutes or something so yeah yeah okay well, yeah, I'll just make a few closing comments and perhaps we can uh, maybe even have another one of these where we go into this, this, uh, this topic a little more deeply. But uh, as, you're, as you're speaking, I, I think back to the previous topic and how we were talking about that. You know, that's maybe one way to, to think about being, you know, a, a quality of, of consciousness in terms of how we live that sense of interconnectedness and connectedness and you know, connection and all being part of some something larger together and if we're really grounded in that in that consciousness then then our actions are different than we're if we're engaged in political change social change that it comes from a different place. So yeah, that, that, that these two are kind of inseparably intertwined really. Um, and yet, yeah, to be also active out on that level to me is very important now more than ever before to think about, yes, with that level of, of, of consciousness embodiment of, of kind of um, being it inside but then what to do on the outside. Um, one idea that I don't have time to go into now, but I'll just mention at the end here is, is that how kind of positioning this, this work that we do with communication, just being an advocate for that it's part of health and wellness so that it be, can become if we, which inc can include the depths of this this awareness side of it, this ability to to not be overly identified with our mind and our bodies, but with something larger, that that can be just part of of health. You know, people diet and exercise and meditation and yoga, and then this way of communicating is just part of being healthy and how we talk to ourselves and others and be in community of support around with this way of, of being in conversation, basically dropping to this empathic connection. 
depths that are really nourishing and enriching. So anyways, that I feel like that, if that could be become more of kind of mainstream of, of how this is sort of part of what we do to be healthy, then maybe it becomes easily more easy for people to learn and then use as part of how we engage in every part of our society. So still doesn't get at a lot of things, but it's, it gives me some hope that um, that vision, if, if that can happen, then it, a lot would, would change. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's the top of the hour. Let's end here. Newt, thank you so much for doing this conversation with me and uh, hopefully we can do more. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. All right. we, we, can up, uh, we can turn up the stones that we left unturned on this That's occasion. Right. That's right. All right. Thank you, Newt. Take care. Thanks, John. Bye.